Now, why Jane King and why Farmers Weekly? We are a university which is smack in the middle of an extraordinarily important county for agriculture. The, the university has a new mission. It's going to promote agri-culture as part of its activities. It's going to become increasingly central. And we want in journalism to build these links with uh, Lincolnshire as a county, as an agricultural county. So as part of that process, Jane has come all this way from London. Now just a bit about Jane. Jane, um, whilst being very modest, is actually uh, being recognised as business editor of the year in the British Society of Magazine Editor Awards uh, in October last year. Now, we have some people in the audience who actually know the magazine as the Yellow uh, Peril, apparently because of its uh, masthead. It's proudly yellow, proudly yellow. But if you're a farmer, I guess you know about Farmers Weekly. It's your... Um, it's your Part of your diet, I expect. It's absolutely essential reading. Um, it reaches more than 200,000 people every week. In addition to that, uh, it's got a terrific website, which is incredibly lively. Um, there's a lot to talk about uh, on this issue. Um, we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Jane. So let's welcome Jane King. Richard, can you all hear me? Yes? yes. Good. I, I've got... There is a microphone there. Oh, right. I don't know that I need to stand that close to it. Anyway. Um, I've got a lot of slides. Um, try not to make it death by PowerPoint, so I will whiz along quite a few of them. And uh, very happy to take questions as we go along, or maybe at the end, uh, because I do, do have so, so many. Um, I was asked to talk about farming, the industry that the media too often forget. And uh, I am going to talk about that. Um, and I'm also going to talk about what's changing in farming and uh, how actually we've got a very, very positive story. But as an industry in farming, we have a lot to do in terms of building up our confidence to talk to the media more and embrace the media because it's hugely important both to the, the future growth of uh, British farming but also to improving public understanding about where their food comes from and what we actually do on British farms. Um, in relation to that, I'm going to talk to you a bit about Farmers Weekly and our role here, because I'm, I'm hoping as media um, journalists, you're, uh, as journalists tra trainees, you're, you're interested in other publications and other media houses, and we're very much a multimedia brand these days, even though we started as a, a sort of a heritage print product. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the new kinds of journalism and about careers in B2B. B2B is business to business. Uh, it used to be called trade publishing. But it's now described as business to business, and it's about business products, websites, magazines, events, etc., for business people. And that's largely been my career and background. Um, I started in local newspapers uh, 30 years ago as a trainee uh, reporter in Sussex, and I came into business uh, publishing uh, after about six years of local newspapers not being paid enough and very poor career opportunities and things like that. And I absolutely love business to business publishing. It's a very exciting area to get into. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, I'm very happy to offer work placements at Farmers Weekly. We're based in South London. Um, so if it's practical for you to come down and stay with somebody you know in London, very happy to offer a work placement. Okay, farming. Uh, it's a fabulous industry, and it is an industry that uh, often the media have neglected in the past. Um, and yet it's odd, because farming is such a huge part of British culture. Uh, we employ a lot of people as an industry, um, and we actually account for a huge part of what this, this nation is about. Um, we're in the news more often for bad things and negative things rather than positive things. 
Um, but these are some reasons why it's becoming a bit of a mainstream topic for the media and why you might see it promoted or mentioned on the TV and in the press quite a lot at the moment. One of the reasons is that the uh, economists and the scientists are predicting that we're going to have a huge challenge ahead globally and that we're going to have more and more people to feed uh, and not enough food uh, to feed them. And so there's a lot of anxiety about how we're going to produce enough food globally to do that, particularly at a time when we're going to have predicted shortages of water and a bit some energy crises. Also, there's a prediction, a forecast, and indeed we're already seeing it, of increases in food prices. And, of course, there's a lot of worry about climate change. In this country, British farming is well-placed to actually cope with some of these demands because we have first-class uh, farmers, we have amazing soils, we have a lot of land in order to, to produce. We have to become more competitive and we have to produce more in order to do that. But basically, some of the challenges facing our British farmers today are around producing more food while impacting on the environment less. And to do this with, by taking advantage of a lot of the technological advances that are there, also making sure that we're very animal welfare friendly and that we're doing it with the consumers coming along with us. And these are all big challenges for British farming because traditionally we're an industry that haven't been very receptive to talking to the end user of our product. And that might sound a bit odd, um, but traditionally if you look at the heritage of farming, we haven't been so good at that, although we are really getting on with it now and getting better at that. And I'm going to talk a bit about that and show you how. Um, Rarely farming is good news. Often when you hear about agriculture on the TV or in the press, it's to do with a, a food scare or it's to do with the Daily Mail predicting that we're going to all be eating Frankenstein foods <coughs> if, GM, <laughs> if GM comes in. Um, and so you see a lot of this stuff going on. And I have to say to you, it's a, a lot of it is complete and absolute rubbish. Um, so we've got a lot of misinformation going on and the industry, my readers, are, my job really is to help my readers get better at uh, dealing with this kind of rubbish that's going on and try and educate and inform the public and get the public on side. And there's lots of evidence to show that we are actually doing that. And in farming, we're just having a chat with uh, somebody here today about this. There are lots of reasons for us to be really positive because... Agriculture is the one industry, probably the only industry, that's actually coping remarkably well during this uh, recession. <coughs> and that, some of that is because agriculture is often counter-cyclical. It often does the opposite of what all other industries do when times are bad uh, economically. Um, and for lots of the reasons that I've already said, there's a lot more interest in uh, farming, where food originates from, and actually what uh, agriculture can contribute to the British economy. So that's good, and that means that we have to absolutely make the most of that. There's a lot of talk at the moment about what the new coalition government are going to do, given the context of all this. Um, and we suspect that... Uh, they're going to be very supportive of British agriculture because it is a huge employer. We do need to produce more food and we do need to work very closely with government to do it. But farmers do have an approval rating amongst consumers at the moment to die for. And I keep saying this to farmers because sometimes when you meet them, they can be quite miserable. Um, and so you have to keep telling them that, you know, you shouldn't be moaning, you should be happy. And here's some reasons why. Because when we asked... We did some research a couple of years ago with the Institute of Grocery Distribution about their view about farmers, British farmers, and what farmers are there to do. And the public are in no doubt what, what farming is all about. It is about producing food. It's, managing the countryside is important, but primarily it is about producing food. We asked the public some questions about what words would you use to describe British farming, and actually, you know, these are really positive words. I think if you'd asked the public 10 years ago, words like grumpy and moany and <laughs> victims would have been very, very high on the list. But they're not anymore. And that's, some of that is because there has been a huge amount of effort of working with the media to get more 
positive messages across. It hasn't always been by ordinary farmers. A lot of it has been done by farmers that have come to the fore as TV presenters, and we'll talk a little bit about those. But this is you know, really, really positive. It's, we've seen a massive turnaround in the public profile of farmers. We also asked uh, what occupations you work the hardest. This is asking ordinary members of the public which occupations do you think work damn hard? And farmers come after nurses and doctors, even before police and firefighters. It will not surprise you that journalists are almost at the bottom of the list. <laughs> I think the public still think that we just wine and dine all the time and don't really do much hard work. But that is, again, uh, a, quite a surprising uh, statistic. We asked questions about consumer attitudes, whether people agreed or disagreed with certain statements about farming. And again, this supports this argument that the public are behind what farmers do and recognise that often farmers are pretty squeezed by the supermarket groups on price and they want farmers to get a better deal and a fairer deal. So what's happened is by working with the media, farmers and the industry generally have really changed public's perception. But what these charts do show is that there are some very tricky subjects around animal welfare and around things like genetically modif modif modification and biotechnology. These are more complex subjects which the public don't understand. And these are subjects that farmers are going to have to get to grips with in working with the media to help the public understand better what it's about. <coughs> So when we ask questions around hygiene on farms and things like that and animal welfare, you can see that consumers are a little bit more uh, not sure of their, of their answers and more confused. So for me, that, I would say that is a big opportunity and that's almost the next wave of communication that as an industry we have to do. These guys are my heroes. Um, some older generation farmers find it very difficult to praise these guys um, because they think, oh, you know, they're not real farmers. You know, they go on telly and they pretend to be farmers. But actually, I think people like uh, the guy in the middle, um, his name's Adam Henson. Is, is he familiar to anybody here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the country farm presenter. He is a real farmer. Um, and I think he does a wonderful job at explaining to the public what actually goes on on farms, the challenges that he's facing. He doesn't airbrush out the problems he has with his business and the land that he, he's, he's working on. But he's realistic and he's honest and he's very transparent about it. And I think the other beauty of him is that he's so enthusiastic about the countryside and the work that goes on in farming. And that is very, very infectious. I think it's brought a lot of the public on side with the industry, and we, we know there's evidence to suggest that it's also bringing a lot of young people into agricultural colleges to do courses, because they see people like Adam and they think, I want to do that, that sounds great. And that's really, really good, because we really do need to uh, bring on the next generation. But we've got some big challenges, and the industry um, has to find ways in which it uses new kinds of language to deal with some of these challenges because the media, uh, particularly the tabloid press um, and sometimes even uh, radio and TV tend to jump on bandwagons and get unbalanced views of what actually the reality is. Now this is a big topic for us in our industry. It's to do with uh, the challenges that we face in the dairy industry in being able to produce milk uh, productively, competitively and at a price that enables the farmer to make a profit because too many dairy farmers, the majority of dairy farmers are not making anywhere near the profit that they need to, to survive and a lot of that is because of their being absolutely squeezed on price by supermarkets. So what's happened is there's a quite a lot of momentum around the need to intensify dairy production and actually go towards less small family farms towards bigger enterprises, very much on the scale that you would see in other parts of Europe and in the States. That has its challenges because for the public it feels uh, that it could not be exactly what people would want to see. A lot of this dairy farming is also with cows not uh, actually out in a field grazing but actually housed indoors. So it's, it's a complex subject area, it's difficult to communicate to the public and actually it's one of those subjects that as an industry, we've got to, we've got to articulate 
much more clearly about what the realities are instead of letting the press uh, dominate and, and, and use misunderstanding to, I would say, miseducate the public about what it is. So this is a big area for us. And we do a lot of this kind of um, content in our magazines and on our website where we do a lot of sort of debate type topics. So we have one person's view and then an opposing view. And as you can see on the top right hand corner, we bring comment from farmers from our discussion forums. So we call that user generated content and that comes from the, the website into the magazine and makes the magazine uh, much more immediate and responsive. Here's another topic, bovine TB and badgers. I don't know if anything, any of you know anything about this, but we've got widespread problem of infection of uh, bo uh, bovine TB in our livestock herd right across the country. In some pockets of the country, the farms are completely locked down, can't operate really at all because their cows have got bovine TB. And the belief is that it has been spread through infected bag badgers that are in the, in the countryside. Um, and this is very difficult. And there is a view that the only way to deal with that is to cull the infected badgers. Okay? Not an easy subject to talk to the public about because we all absolutely love badgers, gorgeous, cuddly animals, and you know they are an endangered species. So again, it's another hot topic that hits the news. And as farmers, you know, it's a really difficult one to deal with with the public. And we're not saying as farming industry we want to wipe out the badger population, far from it. But we have to find ways of dealing with it because if we don't, we actually are not going to have a dairy industry. We have parts of the West Country where uh, dairy uh, production is pretty, you know, used to be huge, uh, where virtually we will have no dairy industry left if we don't tackle bovine TB. So these are quite pressing uh, messages and there's a lot of worry about this about if we do get a license to cull from the government and the jury's out as to whether we will but if we do there's a huge going to be a huge to do in the media about that um, about how that is managed humanely and properly uh, about the badger lobby groups which will be a very very well organized and they're absolutely superb the conservation groups are really really hot on their handling of the media you know they're absolutely wiped the floor with us in terms of how they handle the media. So these are big topics for us, and um, a lot of what we do at Farmers Week is about helping farmers uh, get better at managing them. So another hot topic, as I said, we need 60,000 new entrants into British agriculture in the next 10 years. Uh, that's right across the piece, both in farming, but also the whole supply industry. So we have to project positive messages that it is a happening industry, it's a sexy, vibrant, dynamic industry which we want young people uh, to come into. Um, and we don't have enough career routes in for young people into farming because a lot of traditional family farms are closing down. They don't have a succession plan. So there's a lot of work going on of trying to find new ways of bringing on uh, new entrants. Business to business and the media's role, that's the kind of role that the likes of Farmers Weekly would have. Well, we're all these things on this list. Our readers and our users of our website expect <coughs> us to do all these things. They do expect us to keep them up to date with what's going on in the industry, but they also expect us to campaign, to challenge them, inspire them, educate them and all these things. But one of the big challenges for us is to move our products and our services at a pace that our audience can cope with. And we've got a very polarised audience. So we've got a very progressive audience at one end who are very business-minded farmers, who are very hungry for information, who are very wily about how they're going to make money and adapt their businesses and like advice and like to be challenged and stretched and are really up for it and are very proactive in running their businesses. And then at the other end, we've got people who are the complete opposite of that. They're about lifestyle and they're about, they're quite locked down, they're not keen on changing what they do. And actually, all of those people and all them people in the middle are our customers. So I have a big challenge and I feel a lot of what my journalists at Farmers Weekly do is to walk a tightrope, really, about keeping that audience uh, happy all of the time. This is our strategy at Farmers Weekly. Um, and it is about growing online. So we're market leader by miles in print, by a long shot. We sell a million copies more than our nearest rival, Farmer's Guardian, a year. That's a lot. Um, and we have seven times their web traffic. 
So we uh, want to dominate everywhere we are, basically. We have to manage and innovate in print to keep this going for as long as we can. My job is to develop a team with multimedia skills that can do all that. But like any business, we have to manage our costs and we have to grow what we call projects, which is really ancillary business uh, to, to the main bit of the business. And here's uh, our products. We do all of this and more. And, uh, you know, some people say, oh, I never imagined farmers would be on Twitter or blogging or on Facebook, but they are, lots of them. And uh, they're really good at it. These are our core values. I think a good, any good business has got core values, things that it stands for. Um, and I think authority and independence have always been core values that people would associate with Farmers Weekly. The print product has been around for 76 years. And if you, if you spoke to farmers, uh, you know, 40 years ago, they, and you'd said to them, what do you think the values are? They'd say, well, it's always been independent and it's always been authoritative. But I think the new values are, are, are things that we've attached to Farmers Weekly in recent years because they're about actually moving with the times and recognising that we have to be interactive, we have to be forward-looking, we have to be able to predict the future for our industry, and we have to be more challenging to an industry that needs to change and, and adapt. And my journalists, I expect them to be all these things. Okay? So we live, eat, breathe these, these values. If a journalist goes out on an interview, I would expect... At the end of that interview, the person that's been interviewed, I would expect them to think, God, that, was a, that guy was really engaging, and he did challenge me. You know, I, I think that's, it's really important that, that not only the products reflect these things, but the people that deliver the products too. It's a long list here, but here's some of the things that we've changed with our products. and It's about being much more practical and solutions-driven for our readers, and also being much more interactive. Um, everything we do now is about getting interactivity and engagement from the audience and that has driven huge traffic growth, it's helped us sell more magazines, um, it's helped us win more advertising business because we are a more proactive business and a media house as a result of that interactivity. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, reasons we've had to change, um, I'm sure you've covered all this but Print publishing it is in slow decline, and in some markets it's fallen off a cliff. A lot of the magazines I used to edit are, exist no longer. Uh, they've all gone. The websites still exist, but the magazines have gone. Technology has driven the change, uh, and publishing houses, media houses, are looking for ways to create efficiency. So it's all about fewer people in the editorial office, but people being more flexible and more resourceful. Um, and actually being able to integrate your product so that everything that you do under one brand is joined together um, and that delivers enormous efficiencies. So the harsh commercial realities of journalism, it is true, wherever you go and work, you will face this. That, you know, these are businesses, they're there to make money and as a journalist, although you're not, you might not be involved in that side, you need to be very mindful of the commercial realities of the environment that you're working in because it puts you under some pressure. We, uh, we have these three areas of our business, web, print and sponsored projects. A lot of farmers used to say to me, why are you pushing this website, it's going to kill off this wonderful magazine. Don't do it, you're going to kill off this magazine. When I first became editor of Farmers Weekly and I stated what our intention was, I got a lot of hate mail. I got very, very threatening phone calls. And that is because people absolutely love this. They've grown up with it for 70 odd years. So they didn't want change. But the reality is, I'm not going to kill this magazine off. I think we've strengthened it as a result of going multimedia. We've bolstered it by being multimedia. When you look through here, you can see that there's a, the magazine is a lively magazine, but there's also a lot about the website inside it as well. So the web proposition, it's a, um, a free access community website. It was a community website of the year in 2009. We actually beat the Sun website to win that, which is quite a success for a business-to-business -business website. Um, and a lot of that was to do with what we call our community engagement. So all our content is web first. I have one editorial team. All the content goes up on the website first. And then we bring the best and cherry pick the best of what we want for, for print. We have some differentiated content for print that we work up specifically to make sure that that offering is, 
unique and, and worth the, the cover price. The one thing I should say is that a big driver of sales is what we put on the front cover. Um, somebody on the telly said the other day, I think it was a farming programme, and there was a farmer on there, and he said, Farmers Weekly, it's farmers' porn. And what he means is that if we have tractors on the front or machinery, we can sell more copies. I can probably sell 2,500 more copies uh, with that instead of that. Okay, so that one's got a cow on the front. That one will outsell that one. And it's to do with uh, the tractor boys and everything, you know, going into shops and seeing, and it reminds, oh, yeah, I want to... Because they like to look at all the classified ads at the back, buying a selling kit. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to make the two products, print and web, sing together, okay, and, and do things together that complement each other. And certainly the website has driven copy sales with an, an increased subscriptions to the magazine as well because it's reached a broader church of people. Uh, as I was saying, at FWI, the website, it doesn't, does, it doesn't really compete with print. It, it complements it. And we reach about 300,000. I think the latest is about 350,000 unique users each month with the, with the website. That's the print product. We were, our copy sales were badly in decline about 12% year on year in decline about eight years ago, and we're down about 4% year on year in decline now. So we've stopped that hemorrhaging. If you look at news trade across the board with all magazines, there's a few consumer mags that aren't in decline, but I think news trade sales generally in print are down about 20%. And this is because advertising uh, budgets have been cut with the recession. A lot of businesses are using e-marketing, and online now. So the media, and I'm sure you've talked about this on your courses, it's, uh, uh, it's in decline and it's the print sites are in decline and online is growing fast and there is this quest for efficiencies. Technology is definitely taken over and what's happened is that even farmers are using a wide range of technology and multi-skilling. The main tool for farmers is the mobile phone. So mobile phone apps are going to be a big thing for us uh, this year. But just people are spending an inordinate amount of time multitasking with the technology. Um, and I found out the other day an average person spends almost half of their time awake absorbing media. It's a bit of a scary thought, actually, but at least it'll keep us all in employment. Um, and we send four times more mobile text messages a day than we did in 2004, and almost a quarter of our time is spent on social networking sites. It's a lot of time, a lot of our time. It's just embedded as part of our everyday tasks now. And uh, some people would say all this social media stuff, it's, it's, you know, it's just a fad. You know, it, people, The novelty will wear off. I don't think it will. I, th I actually do believe it is the biggest shift since the Industrial Revolution. It's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, it's driving a, a huge change. And I'm sure you've dealt with this in your courses. You know, we, over 50% of the world's population are under 30, and they're all engaged. The majority of them are engaged with social networking sites. And email, particularly, is seen by many of these people as, as old hat now. So it's, it's huge. Even my 72-year-old mother is on Facebook, which is very troubling because she's putting very dodgy holiday pictures of me up on her site. Um, so, but, you know, what I mean is it's reaching everybody and it's capturing people's uh, imagination. For business products like this, uh, we have to recognise it and we have to be there because... What's happening, I don't know about you, but if, you have, if I ever spend any money on anything large, you know, if I'm going to buy a holiday or if I'm going to buy a car or anything like that, or even clothes actually, I will check what other people had to say about it uh, before I buy it. Because I can. It's free and it's an e easy way of spending my leisure time and I will use what I can access online to tell me whether it's worth having. And that is going to transform people's decision-making around business as well. It's going to influence their decisions about what services they buy, what products they buy, who they buy them from, at what price. So we have to be there. We have to recognise that for farmers, and we have to be part of that, uh, that revolution as, as it unfolds. Shane, roughly how long? Not, not long now. Um, Here's some of the things that people say to us that they want, how they want information, and I think this is relevant to all media, really. 
Um, people want uh, us to help them, give them, just give them the juicy stuff. Okay, so break it down for me and give it to me. Um, uh, I want to drink from a water fountain, not a fire hose. And sometimes it feels that you're absolutely swamping people with too much information, like I am now. <laughs> These are our readers, and they do more than just read now. They're not passive recipients, they're interacting, they do lots of things with us. And this is our view of the market. As I was saying, we have a very broad brush group of people to please and that's quite hard to keep all of them happy all of the time. We call this our fried egg and this is our online map of the world of farming and in the middle are our core audience, farmers and all the people that advise farmers and work in farming. That's the people we absolutely have to capture with our website and the white of the egg is everybody else that we'd like to pick up along the way, environmental campaigners, farm shoppers, ramblers social browsers, all sorts of other people. So that gives you an idea of how big our world can be once we're online and really, really motoring with it. One team, as I said, at Farmers Weekly, we have about 30 staff, the majority are uh, journalists, and uh, we, work, we deliver more than just Farmers Weekly and FWI, but it's one integrated team. Here's some of our channel editors. Our desk editors we now call channel editors. They're multimedia journalists, and they are responsible for delivering content in the channel wherever we deliver it. So that's in the magazine, that's online, and that's also face-to-face. -face. And each of these guys, heads and ladies, heads up a little, a little team in the channel. And planning's a huge part of what we do. We have a thing that we call a daily scrum. Uh, where we sit around a donut table and we eat cakes and coffee for 10 minutes and we have a quick heads up about who's doing what, what's going on the site, what the resources are and do we need to throw more resource at a big story for big story breaks. We do weekly diary meetings where we plan and we will review and a big part of the success I think of media is making time to review and revise what you do. If you don't do that, you will not improve the service to your audience and you have to do that and it's really easy to get on a treadmill and not ever step off it and look and review what you're doing. This is our daily routine. Uh, it's, Twitter is huge for us um, and of course checking emails and all that, forums, blogging, all that's a huge part of what we're about. It's a, a logistical, or, organisation is very, very important and as I said earlier, the farmer is at the centre of all our products and they're all individuals and they're all completely different. Um, just to get close to our audience, we do a lot of this. This is personas. Has anybody had any experience of persona profiling of audiences? Uh, most media companies now will do this. Um, and this is about who are you targeting your service at? Uh, what, what's the profile of the people that you're targeting? And it's really about drilling down. This is a fict John's fictitious. We've made him up but he's a sort of a typical arable farm owner. And it's really about understanding how is John going to use our products and services and really knowing how we can keep him coming back and using our services. And these are quite big in most media houses now so that you focus on and really deliver the right service. As I said, interactivity drives traffic and loyalty and interactivity manifests itself on our site with picture sharing. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures supplied by farmers on our website. I, we don't have to do anything, they just put them up themselves. And so of course they drive traffic because people are looking at other people's combines, how they're getting on with their harvesting, uh, you know, pictures of their latest crop and all that, it's huge. And that is what a really good community is all about. Uh, online communities, I don't know how much you, you've done on this, but uh, we're a really big fan of driving our, our, our online community with this sharing. It started off looking very barren because there weren't many people in the community. Uh, it was very easy to get it overgrown with too many people who weren't, we were just not really doing very much. But now it's very cultivated in that we have a lot of people who are really looking after that community and it polices itself. So if people get out of order and they get naughty with each other and they get aggressive or rude to each other, which sometimes farmers can be, we have some of our regular users who step in and deal with it. So again, it, it's driving itself. But community building, huge part of most media businesses now where you're trying to hold on to an audience. Forums, um, a lot of our breaking news comes from the forums. Foot and mouth outbreak, we didn't get that story first. It was a farmer who told us on the forums. 
So they're, they're, they're the future, really. Um, they're the picture galleries. Taking Stock blog, we, that's one of our big successes. It's a small community of people that are interested in uh, auctions and sales of stock, and we have a very lo loyal following for that. We also have other things like interactive maps, uh, which we've launched in the last year. This is where farmers populate the map online with information about where they've got a particular crop disease. Again, we provide the party, i.e. we provide the venue. Here's the map, here's what you do with it, and farmers populate it with information, and then we aggregate that information and chuck it back at the audience. It's hugely helpful to people, people really like it, and it's great engagement and interactivity and I think again that is the future and we'll get more involved with mobile phone apps with things like that. Citizen journalism you might think you're never going to get that in uh, in farming but we do um, and this is you know farmers sending us stories videoing things that went on in their neighborhood and sending it to us this is going to be absolutely huge everywhere in all walks of life because of the you know evolution of the mobile phone and all that the technology is in, is in everybody's hands. And we've seen it, you know, with the London Tube and bus terrace bombings, the BBC coverage, most of that was driven by, you know, ordinary people in the street that were on the scene. It was, it was horrific, but, you know, they were first there. And that was, you know, that was the coverage that, the B that dominated the first stuff that the BBC did. And I think we're going to see a lot of, a lot of that in, in my area too. i skip over all this because I'm taking too long. Leadership's very, very important in business to business in that we don't just report what's going on, we have to predict what might be happening and we have to campaign and almost try and tell farmers what we think they should be thinking about. It doesn't mean they agree with us and we like it if they don't agree with us because then we have the debate in the magazine. But that's all about influencing them, encouraging them and engaging them. It's a huge part of our content. So it's not just about what went on in farming today, it's also about what should we, talk, we be talking to farmers about, even if it's not in the news. And uh, we do challenge, we put ministers and secretaries of state on the, uh, on the spot. Hilary Benn was uh, our environmental secretary, he, he said when he came in that he was a vegetarian and he said that um, don't judge me on the fact that I don't eat meat in farming but judge me on what I actually do in the job. So two years in we said right Hilary you've been in the job two years, can we now interview you and judge you on what you've done? And he said oh, I, oh, no I don't think so Jane, I don't, we don't really want to do that. So we decided okay well we'll create the news and so the team said well what what um, subjects did he say he was, what things did he say he was going to address uh, in the first two years in the job? We nailed the ten things. We went to the industry and we said, come on, key people, tell us how you would score Hillary if you gave him an end-of-term report. And it wasn't very good. It was 35 out of 100. But, you know, that, that's what you have to do. It's create, you create the content yourself. You know, don't wait for it to happen. We do get a lot of leaks. Farmers tell us about things that have happened, a lot of whistleblowing, fantastic content. And also we do a lot of thought-provoking stuff about making people look ahead and predict the future. Um, technical innovation is a huge part. And also diversification. I don't know whether you see much of that here on farms, but this is farmers not just doing farming, but doing other things, or making the most of the location. Uh, we're about fun as well as serious. Very, very important. My team call it the frothy stuff, but farmers tell us they really like it. So although we're a business magazine, it's not dull and boring. We should reflect what our industry is. It's not a dull and boring industry. It's very, very photogenic. So we do a lot of this, award-winning pictures. We put farmers' own pictures on the front cover, which is good engagement. We do a lot of campaigning around the country. We do TV work with campaigns and things like that. Uh, we have a dating service. If you haven't got a partner yet and you want to meet somebody who's interested in countryside, it's called Muddy Matches. It's very, very good. Uh, we did a competition called Britain's Sexiest Farmer last year. We were looking for a sexy uh, girl and a bloke, and we found them, and that was a lot of fun, and I think we'll do that again. And we have a very un-PC guy that we've made up who's a bit of an agony uncle called Farmer Frank. We've completely made him up. He has quite a loyal following and his jokes are absolutely appalling. Um, and we do a thing called the Farmers Week Awards where we uh, give away uh, trophies to very, very good farmers and we share all the good practice. We go out on the farms, we produce videos and stuff like that from their farms. 
and uh, it culminates in a massive booze up in London <coughs> every year with about a thousand farmers uh, and it's a lot of fun but it's also about being seen to be giving back um, and we must be doing some things right we've we won some awards in the last few years and uh, we've managed to keep print alive at a time when you know, many people would say business to business and print is, is dead. And careers in B2B, I would say I've had an absolutely stonking career. I've loved every minute of it. I've been all around the world. I'm paid to do something that is an absolute joy to do and a privilege to do. If anybody's interested in business to business careers, very happy to talk to you about it. Give you a work placement at Farmers Weekly or any magazines in the group that we, that we have. And uh, we're looking for uh, young people who are enthusiastic, who are flexible, uh, who want, uh, are enthused by the advantages that the web can give us and uh, really want to exploit the opportunities. It, it's a great way of, of earning a living. And that's it. Sorry, a bit quick. But. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> That was terrific. There was so much information there, and I'm sure we've learned a lot about how to make a magazine work. Um, essentially, we're, we're due to finish in three minutes, so we could have the quickest question and answer session ever. But can we agree? We can drive off. We have to hit the train at two minutes past eight. So if we drag on for a quarter an hour, is everyone agreed on that? Does that, anyone have to dash? No. Okay. Right. Comments, questions. Um, the usual tradition is you say your name, um, something about yourself, and then ask your question. Um, Mark Barry, MA Journalism. Um, is it difficult as a publication which effectively champions the farm industry to um, challenge the audience's traditional values and is there a danger you sort of pander to your readers' biases, especially as you said, because the print industry's sort of been squeezed anyway, so you've got to keep your readership up. And uh, how do you avoid doing this? Oh, it's a good question. I should have three hours to answer that one. Um, you're absolutely right. It, there is a danger that you pander to the, the sort of the me and my farmer farmer end who are, you know, put the, put the Berlin Wall around their business. They don't want to be challenged. They're they're uh, you know they're not going to be proactive. They're more reactive. Um, and that, that, that is a risk and that's why, you know, those are the sort of people that I would get nasty letters from because they don't, they don't, want, they don't want change. And, um, but, but my view is that, you know, I think what we've, we try to do at Farmers Weekly is we have editorial discussions quite regularly about what our positioning should be on certain themes. So we have a positioning on the supermarkets and you know, how hard they are on farmers. We have a position on bovine TB. We have a position on intensification of dairy farming and we take a view as a team we don't all agree with that view you know I would say now there are people on my team who don't like our position on certain things but we take a position we might need to review it and revise it or adapt it but we take a position and that's the line we, we take as a team as a brand and uh, we have to be mindful that we've got a real broad church of people but it is about projecting a positive approach for the future and not closing the thing down and also it is very much about practical solutions for farmers doing it for themselves rather than waiting for government and other people to do it for them and I think that's been a huge cultural shift in the industry that farmers are now much more mindful about it's our business we determine our own destiny I think you know if you went back 10 15 years ago it was an industry that was very receptive to what government was doing and waiting for government to do things and now it's changing quite a bit but you, you have to be sometimes I think you know to be worth the value for the reader you have to you have to challenge them otherwise it's it's boring yeah. thank you yes um, my name is George Wilson uh, the reason I'm here is I, I, eat, I, I eat a lot of food this <laughs> <laughs> gives me a special interest um, I wanted to ask you about the common agricultural policy is that of benefit overall to the British farmer? And do, you, do the Farmers Weekly have a, a, an editorial view on it? Yes, we do. It's a good question. Yeah. And this is the one we argue most about in my tea every day. In that, uh, you know, farming families for, you know, for years have been used to those subsidies 
um, and there are a huge number of farming businesses that certainly would not exist without that, those subsidies. Um, so there is a view. Uh, our position is that we do need those direct payments to continue, but that we are realistic in order to have a substantial enough number of farmers still farming to meet the requirements of the future, but that our position is that we would say to farmers that we would encourage them to prepare for a future without direct payments. It is very hard to argue ongoing with all the masses of financial crisis and cutbacks and everything that this isn't an industry that eventually can't stand on its own two feet because it is an industry that can stand on its own two feet. Uh, you know, there's lots of arguments about where the money should go, but farmers do really still receive payments for environmental uh, benefits, etc. Uh, there are people, farmers, who if they were in the room today would be walking out to hear me say that, uh, walk out the room if they heard me say, you know, we, we can do without those payments. But it's a very polarised industry. There are many farmers who say, I don't need that subsidy. Take it away. I don't want it anymore. It's taxpayers' money. I can stand on my own two feet. Very few industries left that are subsidised, like farming. So it's, it's hard to argue for, with it, really, in the long run. And we know that those direct payments are going. So it's our job to try and wean farmers off it and get used to it. Realistically, it will lead to massive consolidation in the industry and you will see a decline in the number of farm businesses, without a doubt. You will, because a huge number of farm businesses couldn't exist without it. Could I ask you something? Yes, yes, of course. Course. I think I read in Farmers Weekly some time ago that a couple of years back, DEFRA didn't get the money out of the farmers in time, and we got something, fined something, as a company, something like £100 million, yes. pounds, which was bad enough. And then I read in a subsequent article that the government had set aside for the next year £200 million to meet fines that we would yes. have because yes. we didn't get the money out to our farmers. Yes. How in God's name can that happen? Yes, but that's that's regulator ineptitude, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the government being completely incompetent. I mean, basically, they had technology systems that were didn't work. Um, it's taxpayer money. It's taxpayers' money. It's an absolute national scandal that you know that it was handled like that. And of course, many farm businesses went to the wall as a result of that. You know, so many farm businesses, and you know, it's it's a, acute. The financial hardship is very, very acute. Now, you could argue, well, they shouldn't be in business then, if it's that tight. But it's very hard if you've had five, six generations farming. It's a way of life, really. So it's hard. But you're right. That was a, that that was one of the stories we we had a leak about that. But yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Kiowa. I'm a PhD student. <coughs> Um, it's a bit of a devil's advocate question, but um, why is what you're doing journalism and not PR? Because it looks a bit like a sort of good PR. PR yes, really yes. why is it journalism? Um, it's journalism, it's not PR, and we do not write about products or companies. The only time we ever write about particular products, you know, which is what I would call PR, or services, is when we are reviewing tractors. And I would say that's good journalism because I have a team of journalists, machinery editors, that go out to all over the country and they put tractors and combines and other machinery through their paces and it's completely independently reviewed and judged. Just like, you know, Jeremy Clarkson of Top Gear would go and interview, go and uh, test drive a car, they test drive tractors. Okay, so that's journalism because they're being, you know, objective about what they're seeing. Okay, we also the journalism is in terms of we'll interview people and we will scrutinise them and we will challenge them and we will ask the questions that farmers want asking. So you know, if the sun is, I don't know, whatever the sun says, it is the voice of Middle England or whatever they like to say. You know, farming, Farmers Weekly is the, is the voice of farmers. Sometimes we might say things that farmers don't necessarily all want to hear. But as I said to you, that's important. But I think, you know, we, we uh, journalists prepare their questions before they go. Uh, they ask people. We always insist on having one or two challenging questions. We, we look for factual information. We check it. And, you know, it's this is the, the, the issues that, you know, you would address when you're dealing with, you know, 
products of integrity, that's what we're about. And I, th I think if we weren't that, we wouldn't have been market leader for that, and we certainly wouldn't be selling nearly 70,000 copies a week. People, the audience trust us because they don't, they know that we're not, a, that we're not, we're not just a pub, puff for the agrochemical companies. So you'll see some advertising in here, there's a, only a couple of copies here, but you'll see a lot of advertising in here. Companies spend a lot of money to advertise in Farmers Weekly. But you might also find that there's a story in the arable section where my team of journalists have done some work with farmers where actually farmers are very unhappy with a particular company and it's a very critical story about that company and they will have spent thousands advertising in this magazine. So we don't have any problem being you know, tough, on our, tough on the suppliers even if they're a big advertiser and there's no connection between the ads and the editorial. They're completely separate. I mean, I, we have to work with our sales team because we have to understand some of the ish, commercial issues, but there's no, there's no you place an ad and we'll put a story and there's none of that. We don't, we don't need to do that. There are a number of sensitive stories. I wondered how you tackle them. For instance, we had someone from uh, Lincolnshire Human Rights Council and he said that um, suicides amongst farm labourers were surprisingly high. And obviously um, there have been stories about very bad treatment of farm labourers, slave labour and things like that. Do you go down that kind of territory? We do deal with that, if, if there are incidents uh, of that. I mean, I think where the um, suicides and depression and things is a big thing in farming, and not, yeah. not just employees, but also farmers themselves yeah. um, and a lot of it because it's, it's a lonely business it's a hard business uh, they worry you know they're sit, often sitting on a big asset but they worry about it because they're you know they're asset rich but cash poor um, but it's quite lonely farming so there's a lot of issues around that there's also a lot of issues around health and safety mm. on the farm I think it's the it has the worst death rate than any other industry farming yeah. which is again an, another issue for us to, to address but the, where uh, people have, employees have been mistreated or abused, I think most of those instances, to be fair, are in uh, what I would call large-scale um, production of uh, in vegetable growing where gang masters are involved. Yeah. And usually that's where um, it's a, a much more logistical uh, enterprise and quite a di different kind of enterprise, really. Um, and you know, if we had incidents of any of that, we would report it. Um, certainly in the past, I think it would have been the case that Farmers Weekly would have found that quite difficult to report, mm. but nowadays we wouldn't because our audience are used to us challenging them. Okay. You know. okay. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm sure you are aware that there is a proposal to set up the largest daily farm in Lincolnshire. Yes. Yeah. Is that an option now, one? So yes. 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 What's your uh, take on that? Is it the future and how is it going to impact on Yes. yes. Well, I mean, we've had we've said a lot about Nocton, and um, I'm supposed to be going next week down to Peter Willis's farm in Dorset. He's one of the guys that was behind that scheme. I mean, the problem I think with the Nocton scheme is that it was typical farming. They've almost stumbled into it. You know, they haven't. Their preparatory work was very good about what the enterprise was going to be, but they really didn't. The one fundamental mistake they didn't think through how they were going to communicate it. And of course, by not doing that, they've hit problems all along the way. Problems with the local community, problems with uh, the environment agency, problems with uh, the local planners who've got to give approval to, to it, problems with the public, problems with the media, because they didn't think about how they were going to communicate it. So what was it was always going to be a challenging scheme because it's a large-scale dairy uh, production and even traditional farmers are very unhappy with it because they feel it will put them out of business because they're much smaller enterprises. So all round you would have thought it's one of those sort of PR communication nightmares and you've got to, you've got to have a plan and they didn't and actually I think they were a bit arrogant about how they communicated it and that is a real shame because some of the issues that Nocton would have dealt with would have been good to have explored. You know, and our position is that we feel it's a shame that it's been rather shambolically dealt with because we feel that we've got to have some, we've got to start experimenting and have some long-term solutions for the future of British dairying 
because otherwise it is very likely that we will be importing all our milk from, from France or somewhere else because we won't be able to produce any of our own. And that is how serious the, the dairy situation is in this country. And I think, you know, if the public really understood that, it would be, you know, that we, we'd be going a long way. Now, that's not to say that the Nocturnes of this world are the answer, but we will never know. I mean, the, the, some people would argue with you here today that the Nocturn scheme was environmentally better and animal welfare better than 100 small family farms. So it's difficult. It is difficult. But I think the, the plan is knocked on the head now. It, it was too big, it was too ambitious, and it wasn't thought through about how they were going to communicate it. Yes, I thought that was kind of <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, if I may, I'm to that. Deborah Wilson School of Journalism, but I'll put my hand up. I am, I am part of the campaign group that is against Nottingham Dairy. Oh. I would agree with you as far as you've gone with what you're saying about their communication strategy, which was negligible. But actually, the bottom line is, and it's not knocked on the head by any means yet, in oh. March is the determination of the plant. But the biggest problem was well, they didn't research the water aquifer down on top of an extremely sensitive limestone water aquifer. That was where they fell down. Had they thought about where they were actually going to place this and start a small and build bigger, they would have been in a much better place now. Yeah. Uh, literally, I'm not quickly speaking. Okay. I think on that very local angle, um, we'll conclude that. Yeah, Jane, it's been fascinating to hear your yeah. spin on magazine. Let's thank you.